Great, great. So hi, I'm Bonnie Viteri. Um, thank you guys for joining me. I know we're on the tail end of the conference, so I hope you have just a little more energy left for today. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a non-traditional engineer. Um, I originally, my background is in behavioral psychology with a master's in criminology. I have been in the cyberspace now for going on nine years. Um, originally, uh, just a research nerd that kind of loved the space and found myself crossing over from actually working in the hospitality industry to being headhunted as a cultural bridge builder. So um, we'll get into the background of Yahoo and kind of the, the, the many, many facets and the ups and downs of how we merged with AOL and into Verizon Media and then back to Yahoo. And I've been a part of that journey. Um, all the way from that first beginning where AOL and Yahoo merged to Verizon Media. So um, just jumping in, uh, I wanted to just start off with how many people in this room have a Security Champions program? Yes, I love that. <laughs> in the industry, 35% of cybersecurity companies have a Security Champions program. So of the people who raised their hand, if you can stand up for me, how many of you have a program that works, well, you would consider works really, really well? I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Well, surprisingly enough, of those that have a Security Champions program, 65% of those would say that their programs work extremely well. Now, the difference between working extremely well and scaling company-wide, of you that have a Security Champions program and it works well, how many of you have scaled company-wide through your company? Any? I love it. We're going to get to talking. <laughs> yeah, so surprisingly enough, also only of that percentage, 20% say that they've scaled for their entire company. Now, what I mean by scale, it's always subjective to your company as a whole, right? How many security champions do you actually need to be considered scaled company-wide? Well, it's all relative. It's all dependent on your company, how many engineers you have, how many of those engineers work on products, how many of those engineers are interested, or how many that your leadership says that you're allowed to have, right? Because security champions do tend to share their time and aren't full-time. So we're just going to start with a baseline um, to kind of get this moving in the right direction. Uh, a security champions really are these bridge builders to your security team. What they tend to do is they're on the lookout to see if there's any issues as they're building their products to where they can actually embed themselves and say, hey, we have an opportunity here to do secure by design. And, you know, during the build, make sure that we're putting that in. Um, apologies, I'm not used to flying blind without my notes. <laughs> so... Um, uh, members of the development team, they act as, as an extension of your security team, and they need not be development leads. They can actually be just about anybody as long as they have information about the culture of your company, um, the tech stack that they work in, and even better, if they have a passion to learn and a passion for security. Um, champions that are engaged in programs naturally connect the dots between what is needed for security in relation to the bus business and engineering requirements. So, to discuss Yahoo's Security Champion Program and how we scaled company-wide and also the science behind how you can show monetary value and, and create leadership buy-in, we have to discuss, obviously, Yahoo and AOL as a whole. So here is our timeline. Pretty intense, right? We've had a lot of ups and downs, lots of peaks and valleys. Um, but what we learned here is through all of this, the disturbance in the cyclical, cyclical pa patterns, similar to those that are in nature, provides valuable lessons in adaption, balance, and interconnectedness. So really what I want you to take away from this slide is how in 1999, we actually branded our security team the Paranoids. For those of you who have never seen our beautiful keyhole logo, <laughs> um, it was we've we've been known as the paranoid since 1999. So when you see us at conferences, you'll naturally see us, and that's that's how we kind of walk around. We went through um, where we merged AOL and Yahoo, Time Warner, into where we came in 2017, and we were bought by Verizon. So when this happened, 
Um, this is where I came into play. 20, uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we merged AOL and Yahoo into what was known as Verizon Media. At that time, AOL and Yahoo had two extremely different security cultures, very, very different security cultures. So um, what I had a niche in was actually merging, secu- merging cultures as a whole into one to where we could go in one direction. Um, back then, we were and uh, security awareness was what I uh, kind of got my feet into. I was a director of um, uh, training and development and security awareness. And so we actually changed that into what we viewed as behavioral engineering at that point. We didn't want to just be known for, uh, for security awareness. We wanted to actually change behaviors and how that security was done. So that involved our annual security training, our technical security training, our role-based security training. And moving on into the future of where we then separated, again, from Yahoo here. Uh, I'm sorry, from Verizon here. We were bought by Apollo, and um, Apollo uh, merged us back to Yahoo. So that wonderful brand that you all guys have come to know and love, Yahoo, we are again. And uh, this is when we started to grow our, our security champions program. So looking back on all of the different uh, things that we had been, one of the things that stood sure through all of this time was our love for securing our products. So, um, I obviously did not start Yahoo's sec- uh, Security Champions program, fondly dubbed the Deputy Paranoids, and you guys will hear me discuss that as we move on. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that came before, and I was lucky to stand on their shoulders, um, people that had built the Security Champions programs over the years. I actually had some soft skills, such as attention to detail, critical thinking, and adaptability throughout the years to be able. So the giant redwood tree is actually a fitting metaphor because our program has deep roots and our organizational structure, and they're able to weather even the, um, the most challenging of weather and keep moving through the years. Excuse me. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to what we know as the Deputy Paranoids, or our Security Champions Program. Um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, safeguarded information. Uh, the program was initially launched by a small group of engineers way back in early 2006, so way before me, <laughs> essentially. Um, it's ebbed and flowed through the years and with peaks and valleys, um, but the satellite lead, when I came into play here in 2000, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, it had a lot of promise and potential. Um, it was the ability to grow just beyond one person or one group, um, but also uh, full of full of potential. So I was apprehensive. Uh, the program had set dormant for about a year and a half before I took it over. Um, and the, the worst thing about a program that's set dormant is you really have to go back to that initial initiation phase, which is where you're setting the baseline and you're growing that group into back into that culture. So... Um, we really took into account when we started to transfer the ownership of the SDLC, right? So it was a grassroots effort initially, and what that means is it was all word of mouth. So um, anybody that had heard about the Security Champions Program for Yahoo, it was all through word of mouth, through their leadership, and actually being able to branch out. Um, when I took it over, we wanted to take more of a behavioral approach. So we started going out and started talking to as many people as we could and started talking about how we can safeguard the, the program's future as we moved into on-demand scaling our metrics and our automation to create that buy-in. So... The best thing about this, though, is that they had, uh, you know, uh, passionate people, we had passionate advocates, and we had passionate leadership. So, uh, the evolution of a program. This is where we're going to jump into where I start talking about um, reflecting on designing and creating and building the foundation, um, cultivating a program's maturity. So, maturing a program beyond... uh, just participation. So who knows the concept of people, processes, and technology? Wonderful. So how do you grow a program where the participants are volunteers? Anyone? Yeah? There you go. That's a, that's a, that's a start. Absolutely. So... Um, we actually didn't treat them like volunteers. We went out, and the main thing that we, we did is we talked to as many people as we could, as often as we could, and we wanted to know what their goals were. So 
anytime we would talk to an aspire, I call them an aspiring security champion, we'd say, what are you looking to get out of the program? You know, is it, do you want to speak at a conference? Do you want to just learn more about security? Do you want to just, you know, be known as an influencer with on your team? What are you going to get out of the program? And what I realized is that the more we gave back, the more they gave us. So we may have only requested 20% of their time, but for those folks that, you know, as we scaled and I got to know each one of them individually, the more they actually wanted to give. And so we stopped treating them like volunteers and we started treating them like advocates and influencers for the program. All right. So to build a house, you have to have a strong foundation, but to build a powerhouse, you're going to have to have vision, constant collaboration, and organized focus that leads to widespread influence. So fostering trust and ownership with a group um, is an active effort in communication every day. You basically have to show up and use the power of positivity to overcome obstacles, whether that uh, whether those obstacles are time, commitment, possibly leadership buy-in, and listening to feedback that is sometimes extremely hard to hear. You know, every day you have to really connect and be that powerful beacon of positivity. So early vision of most programs is to just spread the good word of security. Um, this program, we really wanted to talk about building long-term relationships and so and partnerships throughout the security team. And so how we did that is, um, you know, we started to, uh, to focus our goals on early engagement, enabling them, and then coaching them in the right direction with a lot of appreciation and acknowledgement. And then this started to leverage credibility within their teams. So what do I mean by building long-term partnerships? Um, you know, when most programs start, obviously you're going to have community meetups or some form of community activity that people come to once or twice a month. And so here it was uh, introducing them to as many types of security that we possibly could, whether that was our red team, our blue team, our purple team, having them come in and talk about the work that they were con that, that they were doing currently um, really started to build interest from our security champions and bringing them in. Once we understood what they were interested in, we could focus them and connect them to everybody else um, that could help them along the way. And so with that, their circle of influence began to grow exponentially, not only throughout the company, but within their teams. And we started to change the way that people thought. Um, you know, you have 14,000 engineers at a company. You have maybe 112 security champions. They can't do all the work. You know, you talk about possibly onboarding to a new tooling, a SAST or a DAST or anything that we want to bring in their repos to. And they have hundreds, maybe thousands of repos, right? They can't do all that work themselves. So really what we mean by engage early, enable, and coach is to be able to arm them with the tools to be successful so that they can go out, bring that back to their team. We never asked them to do the work themselves. We gave them the tools to be successful to where they could go and they could teach their teams how to do the work for them. And that's when that credibility with the teams really began to take hold and the program itself really started to grow. So I'm going to walk you through here. I'm actually going to put down the note cards. <laughs> we'll see if I can do this. Um, is uh, I'm going to walk you through how we act, how I actually grew the program from from one step to another. So starting on the left there in the blue, when we talk about our regularly scheduled community meetups, that was the first thing we did. We became consistent, and I can't tell you how much that changed the game for our program. When the champions knew that biweekly we were going to have a meeting once on East Coast time, next we were going to do it on. Your European time. And then that way we were, con you know, we're a worldwide company, right? We have people in Taiwan that sometimes want to come and join those meetings. So we make sure that we're giving them the opportunity to be involved. We also recorded them. We would put them on our intranet. We made sure that we, you know, posted them in Slack. We promoted the speakers that were coming to these community meetups. What was the security focus that we were going to talk about? Why was that exciting? How was that relevant to the security initiatives that the paranoids at Yahoo were trying to implement at the time? So, and this continued to grow. Um, you know, you have 12 months in a year, two meetups a year, 24, right? <laughs> We actually had anywhere from like 30 to 36 that, that people that were asking for certain topics in security that they wanted to know more about. And it just, it, it really became, became that consistency where they knew they were going to come, they knew the topic that was going to be there and how it was relevant to them and their teams. The second thing was really defining the documented, um, the documented onboarding process. Before you can scale, you've got to have some form of actually, um, you know, 
uh, again, consistent onboarding process. So whether it's people who are interested in the program, where they go and get the information so they know how to onboard. Is it a Google intake form? Is it an Excel sheet? How, how is it managed? Is it automated? Automation was key, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, depending on how many leads or people that you have working on your Security Champions program, um, I'm sure it's probably not more than one person, possibly two or three. Uh, it, it's very limited time because it's not the only job that not only the lead has, but the champions have. So knowing that onboarding process. Here at this point, you know, once once they came in, what we did is... Um, uh, obviously with a background in training, I was able to take some of those community meetups or, or tools that we were uh, utilizing at the time, and we automated those into training processes. So um, each company typically has a source of truth for your training. Uh, we, we use success factors, but we would build out the training. We put it into success factors. We told them where to go. Again, it was automated. So anybody that was interested knew they could go to success factors. They could take our threat modeling course that we had in there. They could go in, take it. It automated an email to me that said, hey, somebody's completed your threat modeling course. And then I would know to reach out to them and say, hey, we're going to deputize you at this point. We're going to make you a full-on security champion. We then acknowledged and appreciated, right? Our Slack channels, our emails, their leadership chain. We rolled it all the way from the bottom all the way to the top. And we talked as much as we could and we prayed them. We sent them some swag, said, thank you. You're now officially part of the program. You're part of the crew. Now what can we do? Well, with that threat modeling course that they had been, um, that they had been trained in through our, uh, through our source of truth for the company, um, they were able to go in and start, you know, doing the threat modelings for their team. And so that's when their products started to become more secure, right? And it wasn't just threat modeling. Um, we also had what we called Yahoo Cloud, which was our digital transformation cloud course that everything that you would need to know to be secured as, as they made that jump to the cloudy sky. And we continued to build not only on our trainings that we rolled out to them, but also on our communications that rolled out to their leaderships. So the lifeblood of the company, for anybody that is curious, is actually uh, the executive assistants to all those senior leaders. Yeah, <laughs> Start to become their best friends, start to talk to them, and then they'll start to tell you, hey, this person has an interest in security. What can we do? Well, here, here's how we're going to get them onboarded to our Security Champions program. So at that point, we were able to build a bespoke dashboard to where, um, you know, before we started the actual push to scale, we had a dashboard where you could go and you could say, okay, well, we want for every 10 engineers a product team has, we want at least one security champion for every 10 engineers. And then that way they are that influence, right? And you could go and you could look at your senior leadership. You could actually, um, you know, filter the dashboard to that particular org line and you could see how many engineers they had, how many security champions we were looking for, how many they had versus how many they needed. And at that point, that's when we've really started to climb the scale. So, um, coming over to um, achieving company scaling and moving on, uh, we're going to talk about how we did all of this with our security engagement strategy and move, uh, and especially the behavioral site, the behavioral principles behind how we did that. Um, and you're going to notice on the next slide. That, uh, that, and the last part about this, uh, the utilizing empirical science and moving on to the research, that's how we're going to talk about um, that monetary value and how you guys can bring that to your leadership. So at this point, I was exhausted. <laughs> I was one person. Um, I realized that I couldn't do it all on my own and that um, I needed some help. As you can see, executive sponsorship is absolutely gigantic. Rob Hines, he is our product security lead, rolls into uh, our global AppSec team, which is where I roll into. Um, I was uh, you know, brought in to lead the program and, and obviously start that from the initiation phase, which you guys saw from the left to the right on the last slide. I had uh, Mr. Hank Wang. He is located in Taiwan, being a global company, it is extremely difficult to scale, especially when half of your half of your people live around the world, right? That 24-hour loop. Um, Ms. Sanjana and Elise and Sandeep, uh, these guys, I don't know how many of you know the term 80-20. Okay. So 80-20 for us means that 80% of the time you do your regular work. 20% of the time you can pursue things that you're interested in. You can go work on projects that you might not necessarily get to work on all the time. So I sought out uh, people who had different skill sets than I did. 
because I knew like to grow, to be able to build these dashboards, to be able to do all the things that I might not have time to do. I needed people with different talent and skills than I had. And so, you know, uh, um, Sanjana is a technical engineer. She, uh, she came in, she started to work on our leveling criteria, which you guys will hear me talk about when we move into gamification, which I know everybody always gets interested in how to gamify a program. Miss Elise is a software dev. She worked on what I call our ratification process. And so what do I mean by ratification process is instead of giving deputies approval ability, because right, you shouldn't be giving non-technical engineers the ability to approve things that technical <laughs> security technical engineers should be approving. Um, we worked with the legal team and Elise built out what we called our ratification process. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then Sandeep, he is our, um, he's actually a, a senior principal security engineer in the product realm. And he was one of our deputy paranoids. And so we needed that perspective, right? What are we doing that they're enjoying? What are we doing they're not enjoying? That direct line to the lifeblood of our community. Sandy bridged that gap for us and he came in and helped out. And so um, being able to legally enable our shared security focuses made a game changer. It was starting to alleviate some of the pressure from us, right? Especially when it came to those security reviews. And then also um, our acquiring squad alignment. So what do I mean by squad alignment? Um, again, when you're talking about such a large group and scaling, um, you know, when we started this climb, we were at 51 champions. By the time it was done, we were at 116. We did that over the course of three months. Um, and so squad alignment, we wanted to align them to their product leads, to, um, you know, Yahoo obviously has, we have finance, we have news, we have membership, we have all different products that we roll out. And so what I did with this is uh, when I talked to our product security leads and I said, hey, why don't we align all of our security champions that are with this particular product, why don't we align them to their lead? You guys can start to take over those meetings. We were building this consistent feedback loop at this point. This is when we really started to think, oh my gosh, we're hitting that maturity level, right? Consistent feed loop, a back loop of what was keeping our product managers up at night when it came to security. So um, here we are with optimization and maturity. At this point, we were able to kind of take a step back. And um, I always like to say, uh, we started talking about seventh grade science class. <laughs> and I say that because, you know, back when like MT, you know, when MTV rolled and you know, phones still had cords and before all the different like uh, buzzes and dings that you get on your cell phone and things were a little bit quieter, you could actually think about the science of stuff. And so when we got to optimization and uh, and, and science, um, we wanted to start to think about how we could um, bring in, sorry, I want to make sure I get this right, our hypothesis and the ways that we were going to achieve what we wanted to achieve um, by using the scientific method. So what I mean by that is what was our concept? How are we going to create behavioral change? We wanted to do this with collaboration and up-leveling their skills. We wanted to have uh, qualitative research on our discussion and feedback, our yearly surveys. Um, this was something that always amazed me. You know, you serve out, you send out a yearly survey to your champions, basically asking them what they're enjoying, what they'd like to do more of, what they'd like to do less of. We were getting like 98% feedback from these guys at this point. They were so ingrained in the everyday that they were asking for more of that. 32% of them were saying, hey, I want to do more security. I've got more time that I can give. How do I get more involved? And so, um, and it, all of that is just by aligning them to the things that interested them and by actually being able to allow them to do things that they weren't always um, uh, technically allowed to do due to, due to legal constraints. So, what does that actually mean? What did we do? So we were using data-driven results to make informed decisions, and we were discussing it openly at all levels, like how, how we were doing this. And we were creating leadership buy-in without even realizing it from the top down. Okay. So now we're going to get into the science of, all, of it all um, and how we use value case studies. So cybersecurity in general is becoming harder and harder to put dollars and cents to, money saved. What were we actually spending money on when it came to, uh, to, to the value that our security champions had? How do we put a, a dollar amount on the time that they're giving to us? We're asking for 20%. We want to know, our leadership wants to know, 
What are they actually getting for that 20%? So the program was still maturing. We were looking at establishing, you know, appreciation for their impact. And so when I talk about appreciation for their impact, we started something called success stories, security champion success stories. And it was through one of these success stories that I'm sharing here that we were able to put a dollar amount and a time amount on to the, to the amount of time that this particular deputy spent with us. So it wasn't configured properly. Um, as you can see, what we used was, um, excuse me. Uh, these are just memorable stories that tell of a champion's contribution and impact to security. This particular one was a P0, which means it was pretty important, right, in the security level. And their passwords were being logged during the execution during uh, because there wasn't any configuration during their SDK. SDK. So this was basically a CWE of security misconfiguration. And our average bug bounty payout for that was ten dollars to $15,000. So of the people in the audience right now, um, if you have a security champions program, how many of you also have a bug bounty program? program. Massive, massively huge. And this is where it's all going to connect the dots for you. So um, typically the time to patch this would have been two weeks. Um, we were able to do this because the security champion that found this as they were as they were logging the SDK, they found this, they were able to patch it into 48 hours. So that was fantastic. So we saved $15,000. This hit 50 platforms and four properties across Yahoo. So we're able to say, hey, this was a big security issue. Security champions found it. We saved money and we saved time. What more can leadership ask for, right? So... This gave us our value concept, or our proof of concept for how we were going to show value at a larger scale. And what we wanted to do, or how we were going to, uh, we were going to use that original uh, value study to, to, to do our proof of concept, is we were going to do the same thing, essentially. We were going to, um, I wanted to use our open source tool. Um, uh, I believe it's 89% of our company is actually has open source code. So we used our open source uh, open source tool that we were currently onboarding to the company. It was brand new, so that even made it better. We had a really solid baseline because we didn't have to track down any baselines. And then we were going to compare it to historical bug bounty vulnerability play payouts. And if we could prove time to remediate vulner those vulnerabilities, um, then even better. And then if we could take that and we can compare it to the industry-wide statistics, even better on there. So this was how uh, we came about of our methodology. Of course, with every methodology, there's going to be limitations. What we realized is that we had to actually manually map tool findings to CWEs. That was not an easy feat. Um, lucky for us at this time, we also had a bunch of interns. <laughs> so we had some extremely talented interns. If I tell you your names, they're about to come on the market, but I can't, <laughs> I can't share that. Um, they did a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the underlying work when it came to mapping to the CWEs. They did a lot of the mapping to our our historical data, and we also know realized that you know this might only be subjective to Yahoo. We were we were fully aware of that. The main thing about being subjective to Yahoo is that even though it comes from our data and that we were able to prove it with our data, which I'm going to share, um, this proof of concept actually spans to any company size. It actually spans to any company that has both a champions program and has a bug bounty program. So you're already ahead of the game and you can take this back and you can now start to dig into those numbers, right? And you can share this with your leadership and you can start to put dollars and cents to your program. So our scanning infrastructure. Um, one of the one of the uh, baseline scanning things that we realized is that not all of our relevant our repos were going to be relevant for our security champions. We uh, uh, mobile was one of them that wasn't a part of this open source scanning tool, but that was okay. And when we talk about un unknown repos, these are the ones that uh, might be lineage repos that we just weren't one hundred percent sure who they mapped to. So a little a few limitations, but overall we had sixty percent, and we were able to actually talk about um, being able to uh, being able to map those back for us and we could build on that proof of concept so all right so how did we end up getting all of our data so um, this is a step in the right direction for anyone we chose uh, these three things that we wanted to test we had to hypothesize right going back to that scientific method and 
we knew that our, our problem was that there was no real, va- real way to show value. And so our hypothesis was that by using this proof of concept, we're going to be able to show not only our champion adoption for our open source tool, so we're going to compare our security champion adoption for the open source tool that we were just rolling out to the company, right, versus the rest of the company. We were going to be able to show whether or not there was time saved. And what we really wanted to know was what was the money saved by our, uh, by our security champions. So, um, the tool that we used was, was Chekhov at the time. And what we've realized is that as onboarding increased, so did our value. And when you're looking at the 60 day engagement, so we did July 2023 through August of 2023. I'll just be completely uh, transparent here. It was lack of resources, right? So <laughs> you can't take all of your resources and throw them at one thing for too, too long. So we chose a 60 day engagement. It also had to do with our interns were about to go back to school. We wanted to make sure that they were able to see this program fully through, right? So they could add this to their resumes. They could talk about it. They could go back to their school and have all these, uh, you know, projects that they'd worked on with Yahoo. It was wonderful. And so, um, you know, our methodology here, again, was we're going to target, we're going to capture, we're going to nudge, and we're going to boost. And that's where our behavioral psychology comes in. It's the nudging and boosting, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And then the results that we're hoping to capture, obviously, was an increase in tool usage. Does our nudging and boosting actually work? Was it effective? And if so, does it need more automation? What's our next steps? What's our next things that we need to do based on the data that we find? Can we take a look at the uh, the time that it took to remediate? And then what was those value streams that it provided? So obviously lots and lots of data to capture. So looking here, this is from the beginning of our study all the way to the end and, the, um, and what we found. Our initial boost was May 11th, 2023. That is when we launched our, um, our IAC SAS tool um, and also our endorsement launch. So what do I mean by endorsement? Um, endorsement is just a fancy word for training. We wanted to stand apart from those normal HR trainings so our security champions would be endorsed in an activity, right? So now they're learning about the activity, they're endorsed in it, they're legally approved to go out and actually do that activity. And then, of course, we're going in, we're making sure we're doing our spot checks, we're doing the things that we need to do um, from a security standpoint. So we got our baseline, and at that point we did what was called... um, what was called a boost which was with our Jira ticket, where we're empowering people while improving their comp, uh, their competencies. So nudging and boosting, right? Boosting is empowering them through competency. Nudging is giving them that gentle nudge to make sure that they're still going in the right direction, whether that could be an automated Slack message. That's the one we use. It could be an email. It could be, you know, just a shout out during a call. Just something gentle that's conti- keeping their focus, okay? So as you can see, as we went through... Um, our engagement timeline all the way from July 11th, July 14th, August, we saw an increase every time. Whether it was whether we were giving just a simple Slack nudge or we were doing a community working session. And so we actually used our community meetups and we would, uh, we went in and we showed them not only how to onboard the tool. Again, we went in and we worked some of the, uh, some of the findings that the tool was, was finding for their particular products. This is where our squads came in really handy. And so as, um, the squad leads were actually helping them remediate those in real time and show them into, uh, you know, are they false positives? What do we do if they are? If they're not, what, what's the next step? So, we had really aligned our entire working sessions to this. And as you can see, by the time we got to August 30th, we were up 314%. Now, that was adoption, 314% adoption. We had actually scaled company, you know, sc- scaled company wide adoption at this point. What I did find is that our security champions only onboarded 18% of their repos. So is this a win or is it not a win? I love this conversation because 82% of non-champions onboarded their repos. But let's go back to the foundational principles, right? We want our security champions to be influencers, not workers. So in my mind, this is a win. Leadership might not see it that way, but as soon as they tell them, we don't want them to be the one doing all the work. We want them to be influencing their teams to, to spread security across the whole portfolio, not just one person, across all their teams. Then it starts to get them thinking, man, this is a win, right? Right? <laughs> so it's super exciting that when we, we, when you see these changes and you see these, um, see these opportunities. And so with these conclusions, what we looked at were our top 10 CWE findings and You'll notice that these top particular top 10 CWE findings, this is, this is typical across most companies, to be honest with you. Um, 
and you know, just looking from uh, top left to the, the variable data findings that we were looking for, what we did find is that tool usage did increase, obviously. We had, you know, almost full adoption for that tool across all of our portfolios. We had 319% was a, was a great increase. And then time dependency. Now, we could correlate that the time to remediation was based on the study that we ran. It was based on the minusing and the budging. It was, it was, you know, it was correlated to the Security Champions program, but we couldn't prove causation. Um, and I think that would really be the next step would be to prove causation. And that would just take more time, essentially. And, uh, I think it would also, uh, be extremely helpful to be generally automated. Like I had told you when we talked about limitations early, earlier, is, um, you know, if you're having to do a lot of this by hand or a lot of data pulling, you know, weekly or biweekly, it just doesn't go nearly as quick. So um, I think through automation with this, we could also move into to being able to prove causation. And then uh, value can also be correlated. Um, that monetary value with the bug bounty, we were, we were able to show dollars and cents. And then also causation, again, needed more data. So um, this is a good start. Our methodology and our framework um, it, you know, it's obvi it's obviously proven to work, and that's what we want to share. But uh, to prove causation, you would definitely need to drill down into your own programs. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I'm hoping that's what you guys take away from this today: is that you can utilize this um, to, for your own programs and take it back with you. And you know, you know, look at how much you're spending on bug bounty payouts, right? For each one of those top ten uh, top tens that we found for open source tool. So, what are we taking away today? Again methodology and framework, champions programs are effective. If you have passion, if your lead has passion, if the people that you pull in have passion for a program, then it's going to spread. Um, scale with purpose to achieve growth. You know, going back to, to how we grew from 51 to 116 over the course of three months, um, it was really that, that cloud uh, the, digital, the digital transformation um, that kind of reared its head in the industry right when we were trying to grow our program and we were able to train them in our security review processes. And so by allowing them to do that, we were able to scale with purpose and achieve growth because we could go to the leaders and say, hey, remember all those security reviews you have to do in order to get your product to the cloud? Well, we're going to train your champions on how to do those and then we're going to let them do that. <laughs> And that is going to, um, you know, to, uh, to lessen your time. And then lastly, obviously, data-driven results are going to show leadership buy-in and appreciation and acknowledgement go a really, really long way. Um, OWASP, I can't, I can't actually thank OWASP enough, to be honest with you. We, uh, our very first, um, our very first uh, gift to our security champions who got a success story was actually to take them to AppSec Global a few years ago. So, <laughs> so give back as much, give back more than you take or more than you request, and um, grow your program. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was yep. really interesting. Thank you. And uh, it's time for uh, questions. Yes. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering, could you tell me how you got to the point of like one to ten? Like we're one to twenty where where I work, and I was just very interested in like, oh, where's that number come from? Yeah. So um, actually, that was built in the legacy. So if we were to go back to the slide where I had all of the different Yahoo satellites on there, um, we had done some research into uh, to basically influential power. And so if you one to ten, right, you want to make sure it's not too big that you're asking them to manage, you know, you know, too many engineers because that one person's going to influence. So it's we did one to ten, one in sorry, one security champion per every ten engineers, and then we requested twenty percent of their time. Um, that was just a nominal number that we thought was actually doable and requestable. It also came from some surveys and some feedback that we had sent out and said how much time from our leaderships of the current security champions that we had, um, you know, how much time are you willing to allow them to give? And twenty seemed to be about the sweet spot. First of all, thanks for uh, the methodology and this uh, um, research approach on that one. I really like this. Um, regarding this 20%, I um, I learned that this, um, so at least in my companies where I was working, and this was not working. Mm -hmm. So we tried this, uh, let's do this 20%, and in the end, uh, those security champions were doing features. So I'm searching for arguments why this is working. So please, yes. tell me why. Why this is working at your so side. 
here's the other here's the other part to that twenty percent, right? Um, I would constantly tell the engineers and their leadership, we understand that you might only have 5% of your energy to give or 5% of your time for this quarter. And why don't you come back next quarter and you know maybe you'll have 20%. We ended up going in, or sorry, I ended up going in and started creating quarterly JIRA tickets for our champions to be able to request their time more effectively in an engineering manner. And so with that, I could bulk do JIRA tickets, right? Whether it was to onboard to our SaaS tool, whether it was to uh, utilize your repos or even just to clean up their repos, right? Because sometimes those, those end of life repos just got to go. But <laughs> we just, um, you know, I would, I would write it out very, very specifically. You know, here's, here's what we're asking of you. Here's how you do it. Here's where you go. Here's the step by step tasks that you need to take to be considered complete. I would assign those out at the beginning of a quarter. And then I would say, hey, if you can get to this ticket, that's great. If not, move it to done and let me know um, or move it to invalid or won't do and let me know why. And so at that point, I could really start to look at those JIRA tickets and do that research and that back end, um, you know, conf- uh, uh, ugh, sorry, aggregation and be able to see, OK, who's religiously doing their tickets? Let's talk to them. You know, wh- what makes you give us more time? Oh, well. The more I go, the more I learn through the activities I'm doing in the JIRA tickets. I can then go take back to my one-on-ones. I can go back to my leader. I can show them what we're doing and how that's effective. And then we would even arm them with communications and say, go have this, uh, have this talk with leadership and tell us how it goes. And so that's really how we ended up nailing down, like to get more activity and more 20%. And the more they saw that they were able to do on their own without coming to the security team and us being a blocker, right? We were really taking that shift left approach at that point. And um, that's how we were able to get a lot of activity. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think part of my question were just answered, but maybe um, adding a little bit different perspective. So, initially, if you're running more in a, in a voluntary mode, also, uh, how do you imagine what is the, the best arguments to really convince pr- on a product on a on a team level, the meaning that really developers, people in the project as well as project need to invest into building up a security champion. And um, I think that was a little bit answered in, in keeping mm-hmm. it up, the, the motivationals on the long term. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just rephrase your question so I make sure I'm mm-hmm. right. So um, when we're talking about leadership buy-in, how do mm-hmm. we discuss it with them to where that they'll not only nominate a security champion, but then also support them in their growth? Yeah, especially. And, and that's of, you know, top down. I think the, what mm-hmm. we see is we have... Um, uh, high level management buy-in actually, but the, the more it goes down the lines and, and it actually gets towards the projects and the projects themselves are not that, that convinced that they can really see a good return on investment on that. Um, they would all say, yeah, there is a security chairman, a nominated guy. And then it's, it sort of draws into those similar, say 25% never happens happening. <sighs> Yeah, and and that's the same thing that um, the program before I had taken over was really starting to run into is like just building that value with the time that they're spending doing the security tasks, so to speak. And we met them where they stood, essentially. We let them know that it it all goes back to that security culture, obviously. Um, You know, I'm very, very lucky to have, you know, a CISO that's extremely involved. Most of our GMs are extremely involved and they want to do, they, they want to do the right thing. Right. And it's, so how do we arm them with the ability to do that right thing? And, um, I think that all comes back again to, to the company. I'm trying to think through your question, but, um, for that 20%, it's what are they learning? How are they growing? What do they want to get from the program again? Right. What does leadership want them to get from the program? Is it they want to spend less time on security reviews? That was a big one for our leadership. <laughs> that was a, a pain point that we were able to help them through. Do they want to do, you know, make sure that they're onboarded to all the tools and remediating all the pings and dings that come out of all the tools? Probably, probably not because you see a lot of that go through um, and not being done. Um, but what, what I learned also through, through this entire thing was that passion begets passion, essentially. The more excited you get about what you're doing, the more people you go out and speak to, the more times you, int- you invite that, that senior leadership to your community meetups, we would have them, their success stories that impact to security across Yahoo. 
to accept those success stories, that security champion would have to speak at a community meetup on what they did. We would invite their entire leadership chain and we would blast it out all across the internet and just let everybody know. And then it gets more interest of like, okay, well, how is that security champion being so effective? What can I do to help mine get to that point? And then it just starts to spiral. It takes on a life of its own eventually. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, we internally have a lot of questions and discussions about the, uh, the advantages of doing financial rewards through yearly bonuses for the security champions that are doing, uh, that are exceeding expectations. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you tested this? Is, is, is it effective? Is it counterproductive? I'd really like to hear your take. So there's, a, I got a couple of answers for you on that, and I didn't get into the gamification. This was originally slated to be a three-part talk, and a gamification um, of a security champions program is is the next piece of this. So you guys will hopefully be seeing that come out soon. But um, we haven't tried monetary, but what we have done is a, a expanding their uh, their interest in security. Right. So if they got a, su a success story nomination and theirs got accepted as being impactful to security for the company, what we did was security conferences. And, you know, if you're flying somebody from Taiwan to San Francisco and they're going to security conference and I've never seen like, you know, really non security folks take such an interest as they do. And it, it creates a foothold. So not it's not a monetary as in they're getting a bonus because you can't see that. Right. Like it comes into your paycheck and okay, I got a little bit of money, but to be able to go and experience something with other like minded people in security, we realized that that was the biggest like push. Like they loved that. I mean, we could give them all the swag in the world, those headphones, whatever it was we were doing. But if they were able to go to a conference and attend it, like it completely changed not only the way their leadership viewed it, but they viewed it and just spread a, spread a trickle effect across it. Yeah, but I'll be curious if you do if you do do monetary rewards, how that works out for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Julian. Thanks for the great talk. It was really yeah. interesting. Uh, can you tell me more about the biweekly meetings that you held? So what? How long were they? What? Mm -hmm. Did you do in this in that meetings? Yeah, so really that was the original baseline of just becoming consistent, and so um, our we call them bi-weekly community meetups, and um, you know the lead, whoever your security champion lead is, which it was me at the time, um, we I would just see what's going on in security around the company. And I would talk to all the different security teams and like, hey, what are you working on? What would be, what would be relevant to the champions? Um, and I would have them come and I would, they would speak on that topic. And then they would make it relevant to them. Sometimes it might be their quarterly JIRA ticket. Like, okay, you just heard us talk on project insights or whatever project is that we may be working on at the time. How can you use this effectively on their team? Or how could you contribute to it? Or, and it would open up, you know, just a, a, a series of conversation. It might might be, you know, a red team op that recently happened, or I mean, it, it, I have a I have a list of things that actually the community our champions end up asking for that I'm happy to share with anybody. Um, just topics that you know non security practitioners are interested in, and so going out and finding those speakers. Um, our community meetups again, there were biweekly. Um, one was on East Coast time, the other one was on um, on European time, and we would rotate that. Uh, and then we would rotate our speakers. So as long as you had a speaker, and then again, just blast it out in your Slack channel. Hey, don't forget, you know, five minutes before, don't forget to come to the meetup. Um, yeah, and our attendance actually grew. I think we started out with like 30% attendance. By the end of last year, we were at like 78% attendance at our meetups. And it was by making the topic relevant to them. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you one thank more you. time for your great talk. Thank you.